What's up, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls around the world? I would like to welcome you back to the Real Talk with Zuby podcast. Now, today's episode is a much awaited episode. We are going to be talking to Dr. Martin Kaldorf, who is a biostatistician. He's an epidemiologist and he is a professor of medicine at Harvard University. He's also one of the co authors of the Great Barrington Declaration. Welcome to the show, Martin. How are you doing? Thank you, Sid. I'm doing great. How are you doing? I'm doing fantastic. I'm really honored to have you on the show. So thank you for accepting the invitation. Well, it's, it's all my pleasure. So thank you for inviting me. Awesome. So I've done a brief intro there, Martin, but for people who are not familiar with who you are and your background, can you please tell them a little bit more about who you are? Well, for a couple of decades, I have worked on disease surveillance, developing new methods and applying them for how to quickly detect disease outbreaks and then how to monitor them. Uh, I've also been working a lot on uh, methods for vaccine safety to see how uh, to see how, uh, how we can quickly detect adverse reactions if there are any after vaccines. Uh, so that's my background. And uh, then when the pandemic hit, I was very surprised because the official narrative was very different from what I thought was the best approach as an infectious disease epidemiologists working on, on disease outbreaks. Absolutely. So what was the first thing that struck you when this all began that you felt wasn't right in terms of your own work and knowledge? Well, there were two things that struck me early on. The first was as soon as the COVID hit Italy and Iran, which were the two first countries outside of China that was uh, hit uh, quite uh, badly, it was clear that this was going to be a worldwide pandemic that we could not avoid. It was going to spread to the rest of the world uh, sooner or later. The other thing that struck me that was not discussed was, was that while anybody can get infected, it was very clear already from the data out of Wuhan in China that this was uh, very different in terms of the risk of mortality by age, so that there's more than a thousandfold difference between the oldest and the youngest member of society. So the natural thing to do then, uh, which is included in uh, all the pandemic preparedness plans that countries have prepared years before, was you want to protect the older high-risk people because they are the ones at high risk of dying from this COVID while not limiting the lives of children and young adults uh, who are at minuscule risk in terms of death from this disease. They can get it and they do get it, but in terms of uh, mortality, they are at minuscule risk. Mm -hmm. And why do you think that seemingly obvious point, which we've known for a long, a long time now, um, why do you think that that still continues to be largely ignored and has been routinely ignored over the past 18 to 20 months now? Uh, I don't know. It surprises me. It doesn't make any public health sense. It doesn't make scientific sense. And we're still living with that because uh, right now there's a lot of emphasis on vaccinating children uh, or putting mandates on working age adults, while there are still older people who have not gotten the vaccine who needs it, uh, mm -hmm. both in the United States as well as in other parts of the world uh, where there's still a vaccine shortage. So the emphasis should be to vaccinate those remaining uh, older people who have not yet been vaccinated and who have not had COVID. Mm -hmm. So I don't know why people don't uh, view this, they don't see the very clear risk differentiation by age. Mm. And as someone who looks into vaccine adverse effects and potential risks, what do you think those are for children in particular? Because right now, as we record this, there's been this push, it seems in the USA to vaccinate even children as young as five years old, uh, which to me, sounds totally crazy, but as people like to remind me, I'm not an epidemiologist or a vaccine expert. So that's part of why I wanted to speak to somebody who is, but to me on a, a very surface basic level, when I see the statistics that are out there um, and look at the fact that it doesn't seem like this has been rigorously tested, especially on people that young, it strikes me as something that is extraordinarily reckless. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, I think it is surprising Whenever you have a drug, new drug or vaccine, not COVID or something else, it takes a couple of years before we have a complete picture of adverse reactions. Uh, 
Uh, also, in the beginning of the COVID, we didn't know that there would be adverse reactions to myocarditis, which is an inflammation of the heart. Now we know that, but that took uh, a number of months before we knew that. And it's also uh, uh, the risk that is highest among uh, uh, children and young adults. So the way I view it is that for older people, this is a no-brainer to get the vaccine if you haven't already had COVID and therefore have natural immunity, but it's a no-brainer because even if there are maybe some unknown small risk from the vaccine, the benefit of taking the vaccine is great in terms of reducing mortality by 90-95%. So uh, every old person should obviously get this vaccine. But for children, it's not at all clear-cut because the risk from uh, dying from this is minuscule. The risk for uh, hospitalization is very, very small. So therefore, it's not at all clear whether the benefits outweigh the risk for children. Mm. So I'm very surprised uh, that there's such a big push to vaccinate children. Um, I saw some studies saying that for teenage boys in particular, the risk of hospitalization from myocarditis after getting the shot is considerably higher. I think it's set up to five or six times higher than the risk of a teenage boy actually being hospitalized if they were to catch COVID. Have you seen that study? I didn't see that particular study, but that sounds right, uh, because I think the risk of myocarditis might be one in 5,000 or one in 10,000 or so among young boys. I haven't, we don't know the exact number yet. So that's not insignificant, but the risk, of course, for uh, from COVID is very, very small. So it's not at all. So that could very well be the case. And uh, that's just one example. And there could be other adverse reactions that we don't know about yet. Mm. Another thing that uh, I wanted to ask you about, another thing that's being completely ignored in a lot of policies and even a lot of conversations is naturally acquired immunity. So at this stage, hundreds of millions of people, if not potentially a billion plus people around the world, have actually already contracted the disease and recovered from it and thus acquired natural immunity, which again, according to studies even out of Israel, um, is proven to be at least, but perhaps several times as strong as vaccine-induced immunity. And this is something that is largely ignored. I know that there are a couple of countries where it is considered and it's recognized and acknowledged. But if you look at a lot of the conversations and the policies, people are still acting like this just doesn't exist. It's as simple as people being vaccinated or not vaccinated. It doesn't matter if you've had it or not. It doesn't matter if you have antibodies or not. And there, there's this insane push just to vaccinate absolutely everybody. Um, why do you think... So can you break down a little bit more about natural immunity itself, and perhaps also leading on from there, what you think is going on with that? Well, first of all, we have known about natural immunity since at least uh, 430 BC during the Athenian plague. So this is not a new concept. Uh, at that mm -hmm. time, they were using people who recovered from the plague to care for, uh, uh, I don't know if they had called them nurses, but to care for, for people. Uh, so uh, we have known that for a long time, and suddenly now, last year, we forgot about it, which is truly astonishing. Uh, and we are, act we are behaving uh, in terms of public health policy if it doesn't exist. So you're right. Uh, the study from Israel showed that uh, uh, if you are vaccinated, you have 27 times as high risk of symptomatic COVID disease than if you had a prior COVID disease. Uh, so that's a huge difference. And in, in both groups, there were zero deaths, both the vaccines and natural immunity protects well against death. But uh, uh, there's no reason to discriminate against those with natural immunity towards those who have uh, had, uh, had the vaccine. And it's, it's actually very, I think, discriminatory because at least in the US, we've had the essential workers who worked throughout the pandemic to... Uh, deliver pizzas to those people working at home, the Zoom class, uh, who will make sure that their electricity and garbage collections and uh, et cetera. And also, of mm. course, uh, uh, personnel in, uh, in nursing homes and hospitals who have been out there working, and many of them have contracted COVID as part of their work. Mm. And now they have superior immunity, but these nurses 
are now being fired by those hospital administrators that were sitting at home, even though the nurses have better, stronger, longer lasting immunity than the vaccinated uh, administrators. So it's very discriminatory, it's very unscientific uh, to do this. They should do the opposite. Yes. Because uh, older people, if uh, if you're 88 years old, you're frail, then even if you're vaccinated, Yes, the COVID has a risk with it because the immune system is uh, it's not as good as it used to be in younger mm-hmm. ages. So uh, it would make sense actually to hire nurses uh, to uh, with have national immunity to specifically care for those older, frailer patients. They are the ones, it's those with national immunity that are the least risk of infecting them. Same in nursing homes. Uh, we should try to hire these people who have national immunity because they are the uh, least likely to uh, pass on COVID to uh, older, frail, frail patients. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with you 100%. And it's also very bizarre because you're having, you know, people, especially in governments, but even outside of them, talking out of both sides of their mouths. On one hand, they're saying that the hospitals are overwhelmed and that is the greatest concern and that's the whole urge of why they want to vaccinate everyone. And then on the other hand, they're advocating policies which are leading to staff shortages. You're, you're firing thousands of nurses, uh, doctors, technicians, uh, as you said, many of whom have already contracted this. The same people who were heroes last year, just less than a year ago, they were calling all of these people heroes, and now they're coercing them and threatening their jobs and even outright forcing them out, which obviously, again, this is a very obvious thing, is going to create a greater risk, if there is any kind of upsurge, of the hospitals truly being overwhelmed. Yes, um, that's so true. And uh, we also have a lot of uh, health needs that were ignored during the pandemic, mm-hmm. uh, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, uh, cancer, childhood vaccinations, and so on. And uh, we need healthcare personnel to take care of that also. So we have sort of this de- deficit that we need to catch up with. So we need uh, people working uh, in the healthcare sector. Absolutely. Can we talk a little bit about the lockdowns? Because I know you co-authored the Great Barrington Declaration, which has now been signed by approaching a million people, I believe. Um, is, that, is, that, is that number correct? Am I right in saying it's approaching a million? I think it's about 850,000 or something like that. Okay. For people who are not familiar with what it is, can you explain what the Great Barrington Declaration is and why you wrote it? So in 2020, it was very frustrating to be a a scientist because there was this uh, perceived consensus that uh, everybody in public health and epidemiologists agreed that lockdown was the way to go. And when I talked to my colleagues who I need you know personally infectious disease immunologist, uh, it was the opposite. Most did not approve the lockdowns and thought we should instead focus on protecting the older, high-risk people. But there was this perceived uh, consensus. So what we did was, together with two colleagues, uh, Dr. Jay Bhattacharya at Stanford University and Dr. Snatagupta at Oxford University, who in my view is the preeminent infectious disease epidemiologist in the world. We, uh, we came together and we wrote a one-page uh, document uh, uh, that we named the Great Barrington Declaration because we did it in Great Barrington, Massachusetts. And what we argue was that we need, the general lockdowns are not going to properly protect the older vulnerable people, the older high-risk people. And we have seen that now to be true. There were uh, like uh, a lot of older people died uh, over 700,000 reported deaths in the US alone. And they were not protected by these general lockdowns, by school closures and so on. So we were arguing for that we need to do a much better job protecting this older vulnerable population. And we we listed uh, both in the declaration, but also in an FAQ, uh, several dozens very concrete examples of what we needed to do. At the same time, closing schools have no benefit on uh, uh, on uh, on the pandemic. Uh, it just creates uh, collateral damage on education for children. So they have they have carried the the biggest burden of of this uh, uh, of these lockdowns. 
and also young adults. They should be able to uh, continue living their lives and uh, run the society while older people were uh, shielded and protected. So it's very, it was nothing new in it. Uh, these are things that uh, people have been discussing for, for many years uh, as in the preparedness of a pandemic. So it's very basic uh, public health principles, but uh, it got very much support with many signatures, including many scientists and medical uh, professionals. But it was also received a lot of pushback from more politically oriented uh, people. Mm, yeah, I think this politicization of science and medicine and public health policy has been an absolute travesty from country to country, city to city throughout this entire situation. Um, I've spoken to and know and have in my family doctors. I've spoken to so many doctors and scientists and just generally intelligent people around the world. And for people who are thinking with, with a very clear head and trying to keep their emotions out of it and just simply look at the data and the statistics and just to think further down the line of the second order effects, third order in terms of physical health, mental health, uh, healthcare systems, the economy, people's jobs, people's livelihoods, impact on children, all of these things it was very obvious to me from early on that the lockdowns could potentially, in my mind, certainly cause more damage than the virus itself, especially considering uh, how ineffective they'd likely be given the nature of a coronavirus. But as you said, it seems like all of this information, which was previously known, I believe, I'm pretty, uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe even the world... World Health Organization itself, um, in terms of their pandemic preparedness, had suggested in the past that lockdowns are ineffective and shouldn't be used. You shouldn't be quarantining healthy people. I think even masks, they didn't necessarily recommend that everybody wears masks. But it seems all of this just got thrown out of the window, not just in one country, but in most countries. And they just kind of barreled along with this uh, political agenda based around lockdowns and mandates, and it's still going in many places. Yeah, it's weird. And as a public health scientist, uh, it's absolutely stunning. And you're right about the politicization of things because uh, I'm a native of Sweden, and I was very supportive of keeping the schools open there, which mm -hmm. I think they did a good job. They didn't close uh, the, the schools as in many other mm -hmm. countries. Um, uh, Sweden has a social democratic government, so I guess in Sweden I was a, a socialist uh, fanatic. And then I was also supporting Florida in the U.S. where schools were kept open, who has a uh, Republican governor, so in the U.S. I'm a right-wing fanatic. So depending <laughs> on uh, where I am, I'm either on, way on the left or way on the right. But yeah. uh, this is just public health, so it's just basic uh, principles that we should follow, no matter if you're on the left or right or in the center or whatever. Absolutely. Why do you think that Sweden specifically, out of many Western countries, was one of the only few that took such a unique and level-headed, calm approach? So I think Sweden, as well as the other Scandinavian countries, uh, did quite well. Uh, with fairly similar approaches. Sweden has been more in the news, but other uh, Scandinavian countries also didn't lock down uh, that much uh, and also have very good results, uh, just like uh, compared to other European and, and world countries. I'm not quite sure exactly. I mean, Sweden has good uh, epidemiologists in Anders Tegnell and Johan Giesecke who uh, were able to keep their heads cool. Um, uh, so I think that's one reason. Another reason is that there's a lot of trust. They were very honest about the public health. They weren't, they weren't saying a lot of nonsense. So therefore, mm -hmm. they were able to maintain trust between um, public health authorities and the population. And it's a two-way street because if public health officials want the public to trust them, then public health officials also have to trust the public. It, it can never be a one-way street. Mm -hmm. But I'm not quite sure exactly uh, why it is. So. Uh, uh, people who know more about uh, sociology or, or politics might be better to answer that question than I can. 
Yeah, no, I think what you just said there is so important about the trust, because trust is something that has just been so significantly eroded, perhaps irreparably, over the past 20 months, which is which is a big shame. And I think that one of the things that's been extremely concerning about this whole situation has been not just the lack of honesty, but the lack of transparency, the unwillingness, and even pushback against people thinking or speaking or debating or having conversations, whether you're talking about, you know, I'm going to put this video up on YouTube, but I don't know, YouTube could decide to deplatform it. They, uh, you know, it's people are being shut down. Even doctors and scientists and experts are having videos removed. They're being, um, I've heard of people being, you know, bullied and shamed and coerced, people having, uh, being threatened to have their medical licenses revoked or being pushed out of certain communities, all of this kind of stuff, which again, it's, it's concerning being from countries which are supposed to be free and which are supposed to uh, support scientific inquiry and freedom of speech. And then also the nature of science and medicine itself is based around conversation and inquiry and challenge, not just going along and, you know, trust the experts and follow the science. But to me, it should be question the experts and challenge and question the science, because especially when there's something that's very, very obvious that even someone who's not a virologist or an epidemiologist can look at and say, wait, that doesn't, that doesn't seem to make sense. Or that looks contradictory. But instead of saying, okay, look, this is the explanation. They're just saying, shut up. You're not allowed to say that. Don't even talk about it. Don't even think about it. Well, I think you understand how science should operate better than some scientists. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, science can on? only operate if, if function, if you have these uh, discussions. And uh, uh, many people have been censored. I've been censored by YouTube, LinkedIn, Facebook, uh, and Twitter. Wow. So, uh, and many others have as well. So uh, they are censoring uh, uh, people who have long uh, standing experience with infectious disease outbreaks. So that's pretty uh, amazing. Uh, and that's not how you could do science. So. Um, well when you say you've been censored by those platforms, can you speak a little bit more about what specifically happened? So LinkedIn has uh, took down a couple of posts that I did there. I'm still on LinkedIn, but they, they removed a couple of posts. Uh, as Twitter removed one post and put a warning on a different one. Um, and YouTube removed, uh, I, I was participating in a round table with, uh, that was organized by the Florida governor DeSantis and YouTube removed that roundtable, and Facebook uh, took down the uh, Great Barrington Declaration, censored the Great Barrington Declaration because we posted a pro-vaccine uh, uh, message uh, post there, and they took, they took it down because of that. Just a moment there. So you said with Facebook, you posted something that was pro-vaccine, and they took that down? Yes. Okay, that's that sounds uh, that sounds surprising. Uh, what what was Actually, the post? Actually, I used I used to serve on the CDC committee uh, for uh, a working group for uh, evaluating the uh, the safety of the COVID vaccines. And at one point, CDC decided that they were going to do a pass on the Johnson and Johnson vaccine. And I thought that was a mistake because this vaccine was barely needed for uh, older people who are at high risk of, uh, of death from COVID. And the J&J is a one dose vaccine. So it's the perfect vaccine to reach, uh, hard to reach people like in rural areas or homeless people. So I thought that was not a good idea to, uh, to do a pass on that vaccine for older people because there was, while well, there was uh, indication of some blood clot plus uh, problems in younger people, there was absolutely no, there was strong evidence that there was no problems for people about 50. So I wrote an op-ed in The Hill arguing that uh, the, this was a mistake to put a pause on the j, j vaccine and CDC didn't like that. So therefore they removed me from the committee. So I'm probably the only scientist to have ever been kicked out of CDC for being too pro-vaccine. <laughs> oh, wow. That's actually really interesting. That's an interesting, uh, I don't think that's something that people 
would expect. How long did you work with the CDC? Uh, on that committee, I was on the committee back a little over half a year before they, they kicked me out. That's so interesting. And something that I know my listeners are going to want to understand and get some more clarity around. And again, this is a taboo topic that you're not allowed to discuss, despite it being something that's out there, which is potential risks of these various vaccines. We know that there are people who have gotten adverse effects, people of all different ages, ranging from myocarditis, as we mentioned before, to blood clots. But for someone who's just trying to look at this objectively and understand the situation, perhaps based on their age and their demographic, what are the risks? What's the risk and reward profile for people of various age groups? I think we've already talked about uh, people in perhaps the oldest age group and perhaps the youngest, but for people who are somewhere in that middle zone, can we speak honestly about that? Uh, We can speak honestly, but there's not always the clear answer to these questions. So we know that myocarditis uh, is a right adverse reaction from the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. Uh, so uh, and we know that some countries like in Sweden, for example, and Scandinavia, they have they don't give the Moderna vaccines to people I think below 30 uh, for that reasons. Mm-hmm. So we know that there are adverse reactions. Uh, there might be others we don't know about yet. Um, we also know the blood clots you mentioned from the J&J vaccine and uh, there's also risk from anaphylaxis only a few like within half an hour after getting the vaccine which is why you should stay around for for a while after getting the vaccine so that uh, if there's an issue the the nurse who gave you the vaccine can sort of uh, intervene and take care of the anaphylaxis but uh, uh, i mean the interesting thing is that most of the known adverse reactions are younger people but most of the benef- the major benefits of the vaccine are older people. Mm-hmm. So therefore, I think for older people, as I said, it's a no-brainer. They should get the vaccine if they haven't had, already had COVID. For children, I think, uh, I don't think they should get the COVID vaccine. They are at minuscule risk from this. And uh, uh, what's good for the future is that people are going to get, p- people are born, we, we're soon going to get all, have had, all of us are going to eventually get COVID, almost all of us. Mm-hmm. And then we'll have national immunity and then the pandemic will end and we'll go into the endemic stage, just like we have for the four other common coronaviruses that we have lived with for many, many years. But of course, as new kids are born, they don't have immunity to COVID because they haven't mm-hmm. been exposed yet. But the good thing is that they will be exposed to children where this is very, very low risk. Uh, they're going to have no symptoms or maybe a cold or something. And then they will also have the national immunity. So uh, that's sort of a natural process that uh, we're going to sort of be in that situation for, for many years because this virus is never going to go away. Mm-hmm. So for them, I think it's also clear that they don't need a vaccine. Now, where do you put the cutoff? Um, that's very hard to say. So, for example, if you're 45 years old, should you get the vaccine or not? Well, uh, the risks are very low from the vaccine but the risk is also low from uh, COVID in that age group. Mm-hmm. So uh, this, it's hard to tell exactly where the cutoff is, but on the two extremes, the older people above 60 as well as children, I think it's more clear cut. Uh, who's mm. the... Yeah, I, I, I hear you completely. I mean, what, what's amazing about this conversation is how commonsensical it feels to me. <laughs> like, <laughs> I mean, as someone who has been speaking out against a lot of this stuff and just following it along and trying to make sense of it all, it seems that common sense conversations like this are increasingly rare and even discouraged. Um, and there are very large holes in the narrative, some of which we've already mentioned, like the you know non-discussion of natural immunity um, and non-discussion of potential adverse effects. And as you said before, I think that if they were just honest and open and transparent about this, and you just gave people the information, just said, look, okay, if you are in these different age demographics and you have or you don't have comorbidities, this is the risk of COVID, these are the potential risks of any type of shot, and this is how it changes depending on your age, whether you're 85 or 45 or 25 or 15, 
But what they've done in so many countries is treat it all as the same, right? People talk as like it's simply black and white. And whether you're 18 years old or you're 88 years old, it's exactly the same. Whether you've already had COVID or you, you haven't had it yet, it's exactly the same. All of this. And to any thinking person, this is obviously dishonest. It's obviously dishonest. And that has eroded, I think, so much trust in the media, in politicians, in, unfortunately, the medical and scientific world itself, even though I know that there are many honest, ethical doctors and scientists out there, the few who they sort of raise up on the podium to represent science itself or represent the entire medical community, uh, these are often not people who are honest. And they're often not people who even deal with patients or deal with this particular disease. They're just mouthpieces for the government. Yeah, and if you're dishonest about uh, COVID and COVID vaccines, then people will start distrusting other uh, advice like uh, mm. China vaccines. Yes. And it's important for children to get the measles vaccines and the polio vaccines and so on. So um, I think I mean, there's a very small group, at least in the US, uh, who have sort of argued that people should not have vaccines at all. But they are a very fringe group and they never had any success at, uh, 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 at uh, getting at the confidence in the vaccines, which have been high in the US. But these vaccine fanatics who now think that everybody should be vaccinated, even those who have natural immunity and don't need it, they are creating a lot of distrust in public health authorities and vaccines. And that's going to have spillover mm-hmm. effect on other important vaccines. So they do, they are, so these vaccine, pro-vaccine fanatics are, in my view, the biggest anti-vaxxers there are out there. Mm. <laughs> I've made you. that. I've made that exact same point before. And it's really interesting. I mean, prior to this year, I've never been accused of being anti-vax before. I've never been called an anti-vaxxer at any point in my life. But what they've done is they've they've expanded this definition so wide that includes it includes people who have even taken this vaccine. It includes people who are even in favor of it. It includes even people who are in favor of it. But they don't think it should be forced on people. They don't sh- think it should be mandatory. They're just trying to call everybody, everybody an anti-vaxxer and make it seem that if you have any questions or trepidation or feel that you don't need this particular one, then you must be against, you must be against all of it. You're against medicine itself. You're anti-science, you're anti-vaccine. And I, I don't know if people who are saying this truly understand again, the downstream repercussions of doing that because you're, you're polarizing people and pushing them to the fringes. You're removing all of that nuance in the middle. And there's a lot of nuance here, a lot of nuance here. Um, but I, I, don't, I don't know. I, I think um, I'm, I'm just concerned about the long-term consequences of all of the above. I agree with you. And uh, I don't know, maybe they don't understand it or... Maybe they just don't care about it because for them it's politics or something, or they want to uh, feel righteous. And uh, I don't know what's going on in their heads, but what they're doing is is damaging to public health, for sure. Mm, Absolutely. Can we talk a little bit about um, variants? Because this is something that people are, of course, concerned about. And again, you're having... With the politicization of it all, you're having some people blaming the variants on people who haven't taken the shot, the so-called unvaccinated. You're also having people who are saying that the perhaps the vaccines themselves are creating evolutionary pressure on the virus to mutate and change. My basic understanding is that viruses do change. Variants are not new. Viruses mutate and they change. And every year you get different types of you know, different flu strands going around and different cold strains going around, which is part of why people get sick with these uh, viruses potentially many times throughout their lives. So what's the, in your opinion, or based on your knowledge, what what's the truth of this given the variants? And is this something that uh, some people are concerned that the va- variants are going to get stronger and more dangerous? Other people are saying that it's more likely to become weaker and less infectious. Uh, What's the truth? So first of all, you're right that we always can have variants because viruses mutate. So that's inevitable. Uh, Now there's two aspects of 
or variants. One is how how well do they transmit from one person to the to the next? And typically, you would expect that if you have a, a a mutation that if it is a variant that is more transmissible, that will have an advantage over those that are less uh, transmittable. And therefore, it's not surprising if new variants are more transmittable than the old variants. When it's come to severity, there's no reason why new variants should be more severe. It, can, it could happen, but there's really no reason for it. And in terms of the evolutionary pressure, there is more likelihood that they are less severe. Because if you have a, a virus that kills people, then they can transmit it to others as easily. So uh, I don't know at all uh, if uh, I don't think that there's much evidence that the variants are neither more dangerous or less dangerous. Uh, but uh, uh, if there is a change, you would expect it more likely to be towards uh, less dangerous, although it could go in either direction. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing that's uh, important to realize, I, I don't see why those who are not vaccinated would somehow introduce more variants. Um, uh, you could think potentially that the vaccinated would do it, but if there's anything that would push more variants, it would be the lockdowns. So mm. I think if we had not had lockdowns, my guess is that we would have less uh, pressure for these. Uh, uh, to have more transmittable variants, so that's the only one. But I don't know if I don't know if if that was the case because you have to do a very detailed study of that. So yes, theoretically, that's the one thing that I would expect could potentially um, um, make variants to be more transmiss uh, transmissible. That's very interesting. Can you explain the mechanism behind how that would work in theory? Well, if you have uh, uh, lockdowns, you have uh, you have some physical distancing between people. So it is uh, so it's not that lockdowns cannot temporarily uh, reduce uh, the spread. So, for example, in the beginning, there was talk about flattening the curve. That makes technological sense because you don't want everybody to go to the hospital at the same time. Mm -hmm. so you basically flatten the curve by pushing some of the cases into the future, so that uh, the peak of hospital demand is not as high. So that's what social distancing can do, but uh, it also put pressure on, it's more difficult for the virus to go from one person to the next. So therefore you put pressure on the virus to be more transmissible uh, if, you put that, uh, if you do that. Now, if that happened or not, I don't know, but uh, theoretically that could have happened. Uh, mm. That's really interesting, actually. I don't think many people had considered that aspect of it. And one thing I love about talking to you, Martin, is that you say, I don't know. <laughs> I think yeah. if more people were willing to say those three words, especially people in power and people setting public health policy, if they were willing to say, I don't know more often, then I think all of us would be able to trust them a lot more. Well, there are many things I do not know, so I'm just trying to be honest. <laughs> That's, it's appreciated. Here's a big question, and this is another one that there's been a lot of conjecture around, but what happened to the flu? Uh, okay, so I don't know that either. Okay. Uh, <laughs> or what, what mean, do you uh, think happened? Uh, one thing that might have been the cause for it is that when you have different viruses, they compete each, out each other. So we know from, from uh, historical that that has sometimes happened. Um, obviously, we know that within flu itself, that one strain will keep uh, compete out another strain. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, so that's one potential explanation, but if that is the correct explanation, I don't know. Yeah, I understand. And what about the testing? This is another thing that people have a lot of questions about, the accuracy of the testing, the cycle thresholds. From what I understand, the PCR tests themselves do not directly um, analyze the test for the COVID virus itself, but for some related genetic material. I don't know all of the ins and outs of that, but with these tests that people are doing, the PCR, the antigens, how accurate do you, do you think these are? So when we talk about testing, it's important to distinguish at least three different uh, 
uh, situations we use tests. So one is if we have a patient who is sick, they have the symptoms, and then we want to test them to, to check, oh, do they have COVID or something else? So there you already have sort of a suspicion that they have COVID. So if you test positive, it's very likely that they did have COVID, mm-hmm. even if the test is not perfect. Um, so uh, and that's, of course, a very important use of testing. Another use of testing is, let's say, nursing home, both staff and visitors. Um, now when everybody's vaccinated, it's not as important uh, anymore, but... Uh, like everybody, all the, all the residents in the nursing homes, I think, are vaccinated by now. But uh, uh, still, I think you might want to do testing of staff because some of these are very frail patients. And there is just you test them in the morning. And if they test positive, they shouldn't be working that day. So if there are some false positives, that might not be the worst thing because it's better to be safe than sorry. So that's a situation where having some false positive is maybe not so damaging. Uh, you have staffing problems, but at least uh, you sort of try to avoid an exposure. Then there's the mass testing like in schools and universities and some workplaces, which I think should never be done at all. Because you have, you're, you're testing like in a university, you're testing thousands of students. And even if you have only 1% false positive. If you test 1,000, you can have then 10 kids who are going to take away from, uh, from their classrooms and their friends and quarantine them. Uh, so, uh, and this is a situation where these are people who uh, are at very low risk uh, to begin with. So to do this mass testing in those situations shouldn't even be done. It's a waste of resources and it just creates more damage than benefits. I understand that. Martin, a lot of this conversation and a lot of these policies have rested on this underlying notion of asymptomatic transmission. Now, my understanding from even what members of some of these large uh, disease control bodies have said before is that asymptomatic transmission is not a major driver of epidemics nor pandemics. So when it comes to this particular virus, what is the deal with asymptomatic transmission? How common is that? Is that something that's been happening all over the place and that's why it's spreading or is it rare? And what's the difference between asymptomatic and pre-symptomatic? So pre-symptomatic is that a person can spread the virus while they are still have no symptoms, but they will get symptoms later on. Mm-hmm. So usually you are exposed and then maybe it takes three days or whatever to have symptoms, but maybe during those three days, you can still spread it. So this means that people can, they, they can infect other others, even though they don't know that they are, uh, uh, are sick. Uh, okay. And is, is that, is that something that you believe happens a lot with this particular virus? I think it can happen. We know it can happen. Uh, I think also uh, you're more likely to spread it if you're symptomatic. But on the other hand, you, if you're symptomatic, you're more likely to be home and not yes. engaging with other people. So I don't, I don't know what the full extent is, but it doesn't really isn't very important, I think, because uh, this, this virus is going to spread, and we know that vaccinated people can spread it. Mm-hmm. So the key thing is that if you haven't had COVID and you're old at high risk, you need to get vaccinated before you're exposed to minimize death, but uh, almost all of us will sooner or later be infected uh, by this virus. And some Mm -hmm. will be asymptomatic and some people can have mild symptoms and a few will go to the hospital uh, and a few high risk people will die. Uh, So, uh, but this, I mean, I think it is proven that these lockdowns, they did not work. It is spread anyhow. We know that the vaccines are very good at preventing death and serious disease, but their ability to prevent symptomatic disease wanes quite quickly after a few months. Mm. So therefore, uh, even if you're vaccinated, you will eventually get uh, COVID and uh, you may have to be home for a few days because you feel lousy. Yeah. What do you think is the, it seems like this is obviously something you may not be ans- able to answer yet firmly because it's it's still so new. Um, 
but do you know what the duration of efficacy for both the vaccines and naturally acquired immunity are? I see that in a country like Israel, where they managed to get a high percentage of the population vaccinated quite early on, it looks like that waned by this summer, 2021. And now in Israel to be fully vaccinated, I believe you now need to have had three. So you need to have had the initial shots and then a booster jab as well. And this seems like it's going to be a never ending treadmill potentially where every six to 12 months, uh, people need to take another booster and another booster and another booster. Am I understanding that accurately? Yeah. Yeah. So if we do first national immunity, we know that it's a strong and lasts for at least 20 months. Okay. Uh, presumably it lasts longer because you're never going to have, you're not going to have it that you have sort of very good immunity. And then suddenly after 23 months, it sort of suddenly disappears. Mm-hmm. So uh, it's going to be around, but whether it still lasts for 10 years or not, we don't know. But what's going to happen is it's going to circulate the virus. So if you've had COVID, maybe you're exposed again three years later, but you already have immunity. Maybe it's not perfect, but you will have a mild disease instead of a death or instead of yes. severe disease. So that's sort of what's happened with many other viruses. And we expect that to happen also with COVID. Now with the vaccine, we know that there's very strong uh, protection against death and severe disease for at least a half a year. We don't know it longer than that because they haven't been around for a year yet. Mm-hmm. But again, that protection is not going to suddenly disappear after seven and a half months. So uh, we think it's going to be long lasting protection also for that, but we don't know for sure. And um, we don't know, um, and it's, it's not going to be as good as from uh, national immunity. That would be very surprising. But then what's happening in Israel, for example, in other countries, is that the protection against symptomatic disease wanes quite quick, quickly. So that only lasts for a few months. Different, some studies, this looks like it's about four months. Now that it looks like five, six months. Mm-hmm. But it sort of goes down fairly rapidly. Uh, so that basically means that if you want to prevent not just death and severe disease, if you also want to protect symptomatic disease, you're going to basically have to vaccinate people every three to uh, three months. But mm. uh, that's, of course, problematic for completely different reasons. So this idea that we can use the vaccine to suppress the disease and suppress the spread, uh, that's, that's, uh, that's not realistic at all. Uh, we can use the vaccines to protect us from the severe outcomes and death, but we can't use the vaccines to uh, protect us from uh, this, tra- this disease to, to transmit to others and to, uh, to keep it down. Only national immunity will be able to do that unless they come up with uh, different vaccines that's superior. Yes. No, I I understand that. Thank you for clarifying that. Now, another thing, which uh, (laughs) I know you follow me online, so you've probably seen me uh, shouting about them a lot, is the whole mask situation. Um, What is going on with the masks? Because earlier on in 2020, even the public health experts were saying, you know, even the Fauci's of the world were saying that you don't need to wear a mask. There's no, there's no benefit in that. They directly said that people should not be wearing them. If you're not sick, um, then it makes no sense to wear a mask. And then they did a complete 180 on this and masks have been being forced upon people all around the world, billions of people, um, again, with a few exceptions, uh, with this notion that, Again, everybody, number one, everybody could be sick and could be infectious. And number two, if that's the case, then this little piece of cloth is going to either prevent you from giving it to someone else or help reduce the chance of you getting it. I'm a super mask skeptic. I, I'm, not, <laughs> I'm not sold on the mask thing at all. Um, but if there is any logic to it, I am open to having my mind changed. But what are your thoughts on that? Uh, well, if we start with the children, uh, there was one study uh, from Duke University where they looked at masks in schools in North Carolina. It was a study that uh, New York Times was uh, writing about uh, 
uh, this study. And uh, what they did, they had masks uh, in all the schools in North Carolina, and they found that there was very little COVID, very few children had COVID. So therefore they concluded that the mask work. Now, the thing is there was no control group. <laughs> so, so I think all these children were also wearing shoes. <laughs> With the same logic, we conclude that it's the shoes that are protecting these kids from COVID. <laughs> Oh boy. Um, uh, and uh, if we take another example, so Sweden during the, the spring of 2020 uh, kept the schools open and they care also. And among the 1.8 million children there, they were not wearing masks. There was no social distancing. They did not do testing. And among the, those 1.8 million children, exactly zero died from COVID. Mm-hmm and teacher had lower risks than other professions. So there is no evidence that masks work for children. There are strong evidence that they are unnecessary, uh, but only observational studies. There's been no randomized studies. And the, the gold standard of medical research are the, the randomized uh, placebo controlled uh, uh, studies. Now, there has not been no placebo controlled studies on masks, but there has been two randomized studies. One was from Denmark. Mm-hmm. Um, they evaluated whether surgical masks helped the, the people who were wearing the masks. And uh, they found uh, that they might help a little bit or they might harm a little bit. There was no statistical uh, uh, significance of, of a benefit. So maybe they help a little bit or maybe they harm a little bit or maybe there's no effect. That was the yep. result of that study, but no, no major benefit. There was another study in Bangladesh which is uh, called a community randomized study. So instead of randomizing individuals, they randomized villages to to, uh, encourage mask wearing versus not. And they found that the masks reduce COVID by somewhere between zero and 18%. Zero and 18. Somewhere between zero. So either there was no effect or there was very marginal effect, limited Mm -hmm. effect of the masks. Uh, and of course, if we had a vaccine that had 18% efficacy, we would never use that vaccines. So uh, the masks, either they don't work or they have a very, very minor uh, effect uh, on, on COVID. There has been other randomized studies on vaccines uh, before COVID for other viruses like influenza. And they also sort of show that uh, this is not a great benefit in terms of... Oh, sorry, uh, just they, you, you said vaccines there. Did you mean masks? Oh, yeah, masks. So, sorry. Okay, okay. So that uh, before before COVID, they had done some mass studies showing that they are not uh, uh, very... Uh, have much f- efficacy for other viruses. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, of course, there are situations in the hospitals where it's very important to wear masks and then, of course, proper masks and properly fit and so on. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you have, uh, if you're a nurse taking care of an Ebola patients, you have to have the whole regalia of, uh, of protection, physical protection. Oh, yeah. So uh, we're not talking about that. We're talking about wearing masks in the community or in schools or in the supermarket and so on. No doubt. Thank you for clarifying that. And another thing that's been a huge elephant in the room given that this whole situation is about supposed to be about health, which is that there's actually been very little conversation and very little advice given about health. We know that the majority of people who have been hospitalized or died of this virus um, beyond age, comorbidities, people being overweight or obese, people who have vitamin D deficiencies. And there's been very little conversation or suggestions or advice given certainly by uh, governments or public health officials about the importance of exercise or losing weight or supplementing with vitamin D or zinc or vitamin C, all of these things, these seem like very low hanging fruits that are cheap and easy for people to understand and implement. Uh, you bring up an extremely important uh, issue. And while age is by far the biggest risk factor, uh, obesity and other things can sort of add or subtract by maybe five years in terms of your risk. 
So if ever you wanted to live a healthy life with exercise and good diet and so on, uh, pandemic is a good time to start with that. So we should encourage people to be outside, uh, walking, running, bicycling, canoeing, hiking, whatever. Uh, so that would have been the right approach, public health approach, instead of locking people in their homes, uh, watching TV or uh, playing computer games. Uh, uh, that physical activity is important and all ages, children up to adults uh, or old people. Uh, so. Uh, I think that was a huge public health mistake not to uh, encourage people to uh, to exercise more. Yeah, absolutely. I'm a I'm a huge fitness and health uh, advocate myself, and have been for a long time. And that's been such a core message for me before this, but throughout it has been just encouraging people to take their health into their own hands. It seems like now there's this notion that. Uh, your health is everybody else's responsibility, which is re a real inversion of what it should be, um, especially in any sort of free and free society that values liberty. Um, and I think what this pandemic situation has really exposed, and you can see this country to country, is it's exacerbated existing health crises that exist, right? So if you look at a country like the USA, perfect example, or even the UK or many Western countries, the obesity rates are through the roof. The rates of type two diabetes are through the roof. The rates of uh, heart disease and other types of comorbidities, which are avoidable or which can certainly be, be delayed. Um, this seems to be the type of virus. Well, not seems to be, it's the type of virus, which really exploits that weakness. If you look at places where people are in generally better health to begin with, or individuals who are generally in better health to begin with, of course, there are exceptions and there can people who can have bad situations, even if they're decent health and are relatively young, um, you really see the disproportionate effects. And again, people just want to talk about vaxxed versus unvaxxed, but we're not talking about healthy versus not healthy. Yeah, exercising and being healthy generally is good for your for your immune system. Uh, so that will that will benefit you in terms of COVID. But even if it didn't, we still of course have to do uh, live healthy for because of cardiovascular disease and diabetes and cancer and those things. Yes. So it should be a, a no brainer for public health authorities to encourage people to get outside and exercise. Mm. Where do you think? Where do you think this all goes, Martin? If you look at the next six months or this time next year, where do you think that our countries will be? Uh, the pandemic will end because all pandemics end. Uh, mm -hmm. COVID will never go away. Zero COVID is impossible. So uh, we can't eradicate it. Sorry, it sorry, to in sorry to interrupt you. Um, when you say that the pandemic will end, what exactly does that mean? Because as far as I can see, the pandemic ended a long time ago in most places. Uh, what is, is there a formal definition of what is still considered a, a pandemic versus just a disease being endemic? Uh, I think as long as we have pockets of people who, have, who are still susceptible, who don't have national immunity, we are going to have the seasonal waves. Okay, I get you. And I think there might be some places in the world where, where most people have been infected and have national immunity, but just also, of course, places where that's not happened. Okay. Even within the same country, within some areas or some neighborhoods, they may have reached it and others will not have. So I think my guess, I don't know for sure, but my guess is that we still have a winter wave uh, this year in 2021-22 in, uh, in many places. But eventually uh, that's going to end and uh, it will then be endemic. There might still be seasonals that we see it more every winter. Mm -hmm. And there will be some older people who are frail and reduced immune, immune uh, uh, system that will die from it, just like there are all people who die every year from influenza or other viruses. Uh, but it will just become sort of behave like uh, many of those other 
uh, viruses that we live with on a regular basis and that we have learned to, to live with. So the pandemic will end. Uh, and uh, I think then hopefully all the restrictions will also end. My concern is that uh, the damage to public health and to science is long term. Mm. Uh, that trust is gone. So that's going to take a long time to rebuild. Also, all the collateral public health damage we've had from these lockdowns and other restrictions, uh, that's going to take a long time to catch up with uh, both the physical health as well as uh, uh, the mental health. Mm -hmm. Um, That's something I think we all have to sort of contribute to because if you look at the mental health, uh, it's not enough for have psychologists and psychiatrists to sort of deal with that. We really have to help each other. Mm -hmm. Uh, within families and friends and neighbors and even strangers um, and be be compassionate to each other about uh, all those mental health issues. Absolutely. And I think that's that's a huge part of what really concerns me is the the loss of compassion and the demonization, which is largely being fueled by the media, the ongoing fear and hysteria. I mean, again, correct me if I'm wrong, but if somebody has immunity or has, whether that's naturally acquired or through a vaccine, it makes absolutely no sense for them to be fearful or afraid or angry at someone who is not vaccinated, but this is what's going on. You're seeing families being torn apart over this particular issue. You're seeing friendship groups being torn apart. You're seeing people advocating for outright segregation. Um, in many countries and in many cities, which, again, the, the ramifications and the ethics of that are very deeply troubling um, to a lot of people, people being pushed out of their jobs, all of this. And it, it seems that it would be a huge shame to completely destroy or go back many, many decades in terms of what Western societies and cultures have achieved in terms of treating people fairly and equally and kindness and compassion and non-discrimination to blow that all up over this particular virus, which as we've already established to the majority of the population is fortunately, thank God, is not uh, particularly deadly. Yeah, so I agree with you that there's a lot of rebuilding of society. And Mm -hmm. uh, I do think that artists and musicians are going to have to play a very important role in that mm. because in many ways you are you have the ear of people and you have uh, the power that uh, we simple scientists do not have so i think your role is very important in doing that wow thank you okay well yeah i, I it's so weird i don't feel like i signed up for this but um i'm happy to <laughs> I'm happy to do what I can. And I, I'm, I'm with you. I think that every single individual, whatever you do, whoever you are, wherever you work, we all need to be a part in uh, stopping our society from running off a cliff. Yeah, I don't think none of us signed up for it. Uh, I was just a simple scientist doing my uh, infectious disease research. Uh, and suddenly this was thrown upon, uh, upon me. So uh, That's what happens in life sometimes, but uh, I think we all have to step up to the plate in this situation. Amen. Dr. Martin Kaldorf, it's been amazing to talk to you. I really appreciate your honesty. I appreciate your expertise. I appreciate your willingness to talk and to speak out. And I think that you've been an incredible source of light and inspiration to millions of people all around the world during this difficult time period. So I want to personally thank you for that. Well, thank you, Subi, and thank you for inviting me and thank you for all the things that you're doing uh, with during this pandemic to uh, uh, spread light over this issue. So that's great to appreciate it. Thank you. Nice one. Thank you so much. And uh, Boo, before we go, where can people find you online? Uh, well, I have a Twitter account, uh, Martin Kuldorf. Uh, I also have a LinkedIn account. So, and uh, I publish things in various places. Uh, one place is the Brownstone Institute, which is a new institute uh, that we're going to work on uh, restoring uh, public health. Fantastic. 
Uh, we'll put those links in the description. Martin, thanks again for coming on the show. Thank you, Suri. I'm not scared. Put some respect on my name.